Hello and welcome to our second program, our second Archaeology Coffee Hour of Iowa Archaeology Month. I'm super excited to introduce to you Lance Foster. He is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and he is interviewing David Gradwall, a Meredith professor from Iowa State University. You'll get to know David a little bit more throughout this program with his conversation with Lance. So uh, I'm gonna dip out, but I just wanna let you know that you can type a question in the comments at any time. We're gonna wait to answer questions till towards the end of the program. We're all pat back in and help moderate. So I'm going to uh, disappear and leave this to David and Lance. Hey David, how are you doing? Good morning, good to see your face on my screen. Yeah, it's a little shadowy in this room, but that's cool too. And you gotta check out my really cool headphones, right? Yeah, very nice. So I guess today we want to get people to know you a little bit better. So a place to start might be um, when you're upbringing in Nebraska. And what is it that drew you into archaeology? Well, I uh, grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, I always had an interest in uh, natural science and history. I, uh, I collected everything. Um, but most relevant here, I collected rocks and shells and fossils and bird nests. And uh, my father was a lawyer, and he brought home some of these uh, uh, bookcases that had the sliding glass doors. And we had those down in what we called our recreation room. It'd be a family room today. And uh, I made little displays. I actually looked up some stuff and even did labels. And I love the old uh, displays of the Historical Society. Uh, they were then housed in the State Capitol building. And I would go down and look at all the artifacts there impressed by rows of arrowheads. Um, not interpreted well, but they were sure interesting. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, your undergraduate years? So um, I didn't know what I wanted to do in life. And uh, my wife jokes that I still don't know what to do uh, in my 87th year. <laughs> but um, um, I kind of thought I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was in junior high and they had, you know, career days. And... Uh, I was misinformed that, uh, uh, or perhaps correct for those days, that you had to make your money doing something else and then you could afford to be an archaeologist. So that kind of went on the back burner. Um, the one thing I knew I did not want to do is I did not want to be a lawyer. Uh, <laughs> my father was a lawyer. My brother always knew he wanted to be a lawyer and was a lawyer, and they enjoyed their careers. But um, uh, they were also supportive of whatever I wanted to do. Certainly didn't push me. So, so where did right, we go? so right before I uh, entered college, my brother, who is four years older than I, set me up with a counselor, and he gave me a bunch of diagnostic tests and everything. Um, and he said, "Your interests aren't patterned." And I didn't need to take a test to, to tell me that. But he said, your interests parallel those of anthropologists. And he gave me a copy of Clyde Cluckone's Mirror for Man, which I read and loved, but uh, didn't see myself in the mirror at that time. So my first year of college, I just took, um, you know, general ed requirements, um, uh, and found them very interesting. And then at the end of my freshman year, I had a chance to get on an archaeology dig through the Nebraska State Historical Society under uh, Marvin Kivett, uh, known as Gus, to his friends. And uh, several of my buddies were had signed up for the crew. And so we went up uh, to Chamberlain, South Dakota, 
and uh, lived in tents all summer without electricity and running water. And uh, I found that really fascinating. Um, I had taken a pay cut from $1.37 and a half an hour as a, as a common laborer in high school to 75 cents an hour um, working for Gus Kivett. But um, I found uh, the work really interesting. And so I went back to campus and signed up for a, a beginning archaea anthropology class under Mont Davis and a beginning geology class under uh, Professor Benjamin Burma. The subject matter was fascinating. And uh, the two men were just excellent mentors and brilliant lecturers. And uh, so I ended up doubly, double majoring. And, and how did you decide to go on to, well, wait a minute, sorry. Uh, you also had some time in service too that fit in there somewhere. Uh, military service? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I squeezed in uh, four more summers of archaeology um, before I went off to Harvard for my graduate work. And then I, I uh, got my draft notice, but my professors at Harvard uh, wrote a tear-jerking letter to the draft board, which got me off one more year. And um, then I, um, well, uh, in between, I've, I, I actually, I went to, to Edinburgh for a year uh, on a Fulbright fellowship. And uh, then I came back to Harvard, and then I got drafted and went in the army and was stationed in Germany for a year and a half and uh, came back and uh, picked up my work at Harvard and finished everything but my dissertation uh, in 1962. And what was your dissertation on? My dissertation uh, dealt with uh, the so-called Nebraska phase, uh, early farming villages uh, along the Missouri River. The basic data were from uh, two sites in Cass County, Nebraska, uh, which I found extremely interesting. The work had been done by a very professionally oriented amateur, a physician and a maker of violins. I mean, uh, Ellen Kunkel was his name, a real Renaissance man. And this material had been excavated, cataloged, and uh, then turned over to the Nebraska Historical Society. And so I anal analyzed that for my dissertation. And how was it that you ended up coming to Iowa? Well, uh, my wife and I uh, both grew up in Nebraska, and we wanted to live in the Midwest. And... Um, I decided that I, by that time we had one child, uh, our son, Stephen, and I figured I needed to uh, quit living off fellowships and scholarships and earn some money. And uh, fortunately, a job had opened up at Iowa State University of Science and Technology. Um, and it was in a department of ag econ and rural sociology. And I've said several times, even in print, that I would have neither the courage or naivete to do it again, because I was the, um, the only anthropologist uh, in this, this polyglot department of ag econ and uh, uh, rural soch. And, um, uh, but I had a lot of opportunities. Um, about and when was that? What what years were that? Was 1960, 1962. Okay. <clears throat> I came here in 1962. Um, I did have uh, other op I did have uh, some uh, other options. I actually was sitting on a contract to be a, uh, on the faculty at the um, University of uh, Nevada in Reno. And um, I was naive enough, they just mailed me a contract, and I was naive enough 
not to insist that they fly me out for an interview. <laughs> but uh, in the meantime, came out to Iowa State. And as I say, uh, Han and I wanted to live in the Midwest. I had done my dissertation and was interested always in uh, the archaeology and the living people of the prairies and plains. So uh, I started and uh, never left. So what was that like? I mean, you were in sociology and you, after a while, um, decided that about how, what was that transition like uh, once you started anthropology as a standalone um, department? Well, that, that took quite a bit of time. The thing is, there were opportunities. This was the era of the social sciences, the golden age, you might say. So we had lots of enrollments in the anthropology classes. They were labeled sociology, but they were anthropology. And uh, incidentally, one needed to be holistic in the job. I replaced an Africanist, and uh, I said I couldn't teach his class on uh, ethnography of sub-Saharan Africa, but I did teach actually a, a course on kinship in the family in uh, other cultures, and I enjoyed it. I didn't damage anybody permanently, but we were able to build up uh, courses in uh, anthropology and archeology span and to hire a few more staff members. And uh, finally, um, to break away and have a separate major in anthropology. And uh, uh, some, some years later, well, um, in 1971, a master's in uh, anthropology. John Reynolds uh, was the first uh, person getting a master's with a specialization in uh, anthropology specifically archaeology, and that was 1971. Was that then um, kind of uh, a result of your work with um, the Park Service and the Corps of Engineers? I mean, does that kind of gave you the a standing and everything? Absolutely. Um, it it uh, worked nicely. It was a good synergy, as people say today, uh, with the burgeoning enrollments and uh, the fact that I had uh, independent independent money coming in, money always speaks, and that impressed the bean counters. And uh, my first field school uh, and the establishment of Ishwal, the Iowa State University Archaeological Archeologi Laboratory was uh, 1964. Okay. And um, we were able to get some space on campus for a lab and uh, to establish an annual field school in the summer. You were pretty legendary on um, your training students in many of those classes, um, you know, uh, the ceramics and uh, skeletal biology and everything. So, I mean, that's kind of something that's, that's actually come down even when I was under you, um, learning that I, I felt a little amiss because I wasn't able to take some of that on. But your undergraduate students learned a lot. Well, I hope so. As I say, I hope I didn't damage anybody. But uh, I got to work. Uh, I think one of the best things looking back on my career is that I got to work with such neat people, uh, some of whom, like you, went into uh, anthropology, but many of them didn't. They went into other areas. But that's the nice thing about anthropology, uh, that it's it really a good is. preparation for so many things. Uh, it really is. What, what were some of your, for, particularly for people who don't have channeled interests. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty scattered too. That's how I ended up here um, as well. Um, what were some of the uh, the big projects you worked on? Um, a lot, you worked on a lot of the rivers projects, and you also uh, came up with defining the Mongona Oneota um, group as well. How, how did that work out for you? Well, that was just great. I mean, I was very fortunate, incidentally, uh, to be able to get into the field with money. Uh, it, it was the old boy network, which uh, is disparaged, and rightly so today. But at the time, I had a letter um, from Will Logan 
at the Park Service in Omaha saying he heard I got the job in Ames, was glad to hear it, and they had money for work in Red Rock Reservoir. You don't do jobs like that. I mean, you know, here he'd offered. Um, I had to uh, figure out how to write a, a research proposal, but it, I was lucky because Lance, nobody wanted to work in Iowa at that time. That wasn't romantic. And I said, yep. fine, let me in there. So we got the uh, grant from Park Service. And with those money, I was able to underwrite the field school. So we started off in, um, in Red Rock. And uh, I knew a, a good deal about Oneota, having worked at the Nebraska Historical Society. And uh, one of the first sites that I selected to dig uh, one of the major sites was uh, an Oneota site, and I was just uh, in seventh heaven because it was just a fascinating site, and not a lot was known about Oneota. Uh, we knew from some of the the early work um, uh, surveys um, that uh, there were Oneota sites, but none of them had been excavated extensively at that time. And uh, that first summer, we also, we did a lot of surveying because I knew that we had nowhere near the, the number of sites that we that were there. And um, uh, the other one was a, um, uh, a middle woodland site with uh, some pretty interesting where similar to Havana, uh, middle woodland. That was the Milo's silo site and uh the onoyota one was the molar farm site so how how did you uh come to decide that there was a particular kind of onoyota the moingona i mean my ancestors i have a particular interest in onoyota obviously because of that <laughs> um so uh but it's a very early kind of uh, onoyota um expansion type of um cult subculture right Yes. So about we, what time well, period? So we moved up um, uh, the, the reservoir in Red Rock and mm -hmm. uh, excavated some very large uh, Oneota agricultural village sites. And um, at that time, I was a little hesitant to just be naming, oh, this is a new shirt, this is a new pottery type, this is a new phase. Um, looking back, I think I was a little too conservative on that matter. But the assemblage from the reservoir, uh, first of all, it was prehistoric. There were no historic trade goods. To my disappointment, I might add, <laughs> I was hoping to get a historic <coughs> site. Um, but I thought that the pottery was distinctive enough uh, and other artifacts uh, that I <coughs> called it the, the Moingona phase, Moingona being one of the uh, uh, supposed aboriginal names for the uh, Des Moines River. And your interest in historic archaeology in particular, that was connected to your work at uh, the Bertrand site as well. Well, that, uh, let me go back a, a <coughs> notch or two, uh, a notch or two earlier. Um, I, I was fortunate to have worked with the Nebraska Historical Society because they did both historic and prehistoric archaeology. Um, then in 1965, um, I had the opportunity to be advisor to a group of students from Iowa State University going to Britain. Um, and I was there... Uh, their contact, these were the days before cell phones. So I was uh, in loco parentis in charge of them. And uh, I got to dig at Winchester where you have uh, more than 2000 years of historic archeology span from Celtic camps to Saxons and Normans and Victorians and so forth. So that enhanced my interest in historical archeology. span so that when I came back to uh, run the archaeological field schools, 
I felt, and this was in anticipation of some of the uh, historic preservation laws. Um, and, and we dug stoneware kilns and farmsteads and uh, abandoned town sites. And then we had a chance to volunteer at the Bertrand. Those excavations were in charge of a, of a man named Jerry Petchy, who uh, I, knew, I knew professionally um, uh, but he was actually a classmate of uh, my brother's and we volunteered to go over and work at the Bertrand and there were a lot of archaeologists in the prairies and plains that were very much against money being spent on the Bertrand and my point was people are fired up about this you know use that to get monies and support for archaeology in general, um, but we kind of had to fight to get uh, arche historic archaeology on its own. And this was about the time that uh, archaeologists, a, a lot of us, broke out of the SAA, the Society for American Archaeology, <coughs> and formed the Society for Historic Archaeology. Um, and that was, I found those very heady days. I remember even my own times uh, when I was getting into archaeology, there was a real division. Um, back east, the focus was on historic archaeology, and if they found some kind of pre-contact stuff, especially if it was, wasn't one of the big known pre-contact cultures, they'd be like, ah, you know, they were into colonial archaeology, that kind of thing. And then when I went back out west, if it was historic, they were on the prehistoric. So I was kind of a, a crossroads in a way of that kind of division between Eastern focus on and uh, generalized, of course, that uh, historic and Western prehistoric. And I think that's changed a lot since then. Um, it, ha done it has. Uh, you see, my point is, and this comes out of holistic anthropology. Uh, basically, I'm an anthropologist. I'm interested in human behavior right. and its relationship to material culture. That's the archaeology part of it. But if we study uh, humans uh, 10,000 years ago or a million years ago for that matter, uh, and as anthropologists, we study living people, then what's wrong with Mr. In-Between? Right. And in, in fact, I not only uh, have been involved in historical archeology, span but ethno-archeology, span the study of living people through material culture. I know that, um I was, went with you on a couple sites in Iowa, um, not only to help once or twice with your crew, but um, the, uh, was it the, the Pottery Works uh, was one that was a big uh, connection there, but also Buxton. I mean, Buxton was a really kind of innovative thing that you did there. Uh, maybe you could tell people a little bit about that. Well, Buxton was a, a coal mining town uh, located in uh, Monroe Roe County, right on the uh, uh, county line with Mahaska County. And uh, we got into that uh, largely through Dr. Adrian Anderson, who is the State Historic Preservation Officer. Um, and he noted that there was uh, were funds through the National Park Service for states to study the archaeology of minority people. So he came up to Iowa State University and met with an interdisciplinary group of people um, on campus, uh, Dorothy and Elmer Schweder, uh, who were uh, historians, and uh, Joe Raba, a sociologist, and Nancy Osborne Johnson, an archaeologist, and myself. And uh, the, the de there was a really close deadline. So we threw together this huge program and uh, we wanted to have a folklorist and an ethnomusicologist and everything to, to study black culture related to Buxton, uh, which dated from 1900 to 1925. And uh, as with most proposals, they cut us back to half. And uh, so that meant that uh, in 1980 uh, and 81, we were able to do two field seasons at the Buxton town site. And this was just a, a lot of fun for me. I didn't know a lot about 
black history and black culture. Um, and I found it fascinating because there are just so many resources there. And at the time, uh, few people had uh, bothered to study the history and sociology of it, uh, although the Schweders and Rabba did. Uh, but in the Midwest, virtually no sites of African-American um, association had been studied. And I never expected to get close to the people, you know, as a, as a white archaeologist. Um, but I did get close to the people, uh, particularly uh, Dorothy May, uh, Neil Collier. And uh, we became extremely close friends. And so th this was interesting. I, I've never been able to, nor have I wanted to, separate uh, aspects of my professional life and personal life. So this was uh, personally and professionally enlightening and enjoyable. Yeah, I think it's, um, it was a big part of that. I mean, there are still two books out about that one from an archeological perspective and the other one from a historical perspective that people should definitely check out and get a sense because um, there's that part of African American history between um, you know, most people are familiar with um, the you know, slavery period, civil war and stuff, or the urban period, but not so much the rural communities that were out there um, that were African American um, that they had, you know, established because of the situation they were in. Um, so I think that diversity you have, um, that connection with other groups of people, continue with Native Americans as well. Um, you know, there's a real kind of um, sense uh, among people of kind of a dislike of archaeology and what archaeologists are about from the early days of grave raving. Grave raving? I like that word. <laughs> Grave robbing. Woo, that's a good one. But, um, you know, here too. And so um, I think that's been a, a you've, your, your culture, your uh, entire career has been. Um, have a bridge um, from the earliest times when Indians weren't generally thought of in general in connection with archaeology, living versus prehistoric and everything. And then that whole tumultuous period of struggle. Um, and you were involved with uh, helping establish a lot of student organizations at Iowa State to help students work through that and to make better connections. Uh, your friendship with Maria Pearson, for example, uh, developed out of that and your work to uh, deal with actually uh, start some of the, even pre-NAGPRA, um, the first, some of the first burial laws in the nation were through efforts uh, that you and join, joined in, in Iowa um, in the 80s. Maybe you can tell people a little bit about that too. Well, I think uh, part of the obligation of anthropologists, including archeologists, is giving back to descendant communities to the degree that that's possible and being involved in civic engagement. Um, I don't think um, that we have the right to just uh, go in with our magnifying glasses and microscopes and, and look at people as, as rocks. As I say, I was a, a former geology major, nothing wrong with rocks, but um, uh, I think we have to look at uh, other people as, as human beings and, um, so this, I thought, was, was a great opportunity. And uh, when the doo-doo hit the fan about uh, reburial or non-reburial of Native Americans, I got involved in that and uh, was an opportunity to change some of my attitudes because I was a product, just as everybody else, of my time. And I did not have problems from a scientific point of view of excavating burials that were going to be destroyed, uh, at, you know, in terms of our salvage archeological work. But, you know, in listening to what Maria said, I said, you know, you're right. And uh, this, these practices are wrong and I can't go back and uh, change the past, but I can work to better the present and so we became close friends. They called us a odd couple, the Indian activist and the archaeologist. But we became very close friends. We worked together. Of course, we had 
people like Dwayne Anderson and Joe Tiffany in the uh, state archaeologist's uh, office to work on the reburial issues. Um, and we became very close friends to the point where uh, Maria uh, officially adopted Hannah and me as her brother and sister in the turtle clan of the Yankton Sioux Nation. And um, you uh, also helped establish uh, American Indian studies there yes. at Iowa that, State. That was another nice opportunity, uh, working with uh, Dr. Gretchen Bataille, who was um, in the English department, specialist in American Indian literature, John Weinkind in the art department, who was uh, working with Native American art uh, and uh, Native American students. And uh, we were able to uh, put together a program, starting with existing resources, uh, that would help meet the state-mandated um, uh, human humanities um, requirement. And so we were able to put together the American Indian Studies Program, which I co-chaired off on and off. And one of the outshoots was the American Indian Symposium that we held annually for many years and the formation of the United Native American Student Association, UNASA and Arrow, American Indian Rights Organization. Uh, and these functioned uh, to help support um, enrolling American Indian students and um, educating uh, both Native Americans and non-Native Americans about American Indians and their vital role in our American history in general. And, and even with, with students, you um, connected with a lot of the students from the settlement and um, Don Wanati and all the other folks out there, they were working in the same kind of struggles um, along with you and, and Maria and there was just a lot of um, activity then. Um, yes. And then yeah. you wrote a book, uh, well, um, be Between Two Rivers too, right? The World's Between Two Rivers. Right. Uh, this was uh, with Gretchen Bataille mm -hmm. and Loring Soleil, who was another uh, faculty member. And uh, we were able to have uh, Native Americans donate uh, articles, write articles, um, Don uh, donated an article, um, and uh, Bertha Waseska. Hers is still one of my favorite articles because it's it's so honest and true. Because she said, "This is Meskwaki history as we know it." Hmm. So it's it's from mythology, from legends, from her clans, and uh, of course. On uh, the newest edition of that, uh, uh, you were uh, able to contribute a very fine essay and a poem and a uh, drawing. Yep, yep. And and you also uh, helped uh, tutor uh, that tutoring um, effort out at the settlement for Meskwaki students. Um, we did that. We did that for a number of years, um, and basically. It started off with uh, a comment um, that, you know, basically to Don and Priscilla Wanity, who are both co-founding uh, members of UNASA, if there's anything we can do to help you, let us know. Rather than saying, say, have we got something for you? Because we're anthropologists or whatever. And so they said, yes, there is something you could do. You could come down and help tutor our kids once a week on uh, math and English and writing. And uh, so we were, UNASA was able to get money from the government of the student body. And we took vans down there once a week. And uh, I was a little concerned that they might ask me to tutor somebody in math. And <laughs> I had enough trouble with the old math, much less the new math. Yeah, it's well, not my strength. So my first assignment, there were these two uh, lovely young women, uh, high school students, and they had a reading assignment. 
and their reading assignment had to do with LSB Leakey and the finding of Zinjanthropus. And I thought, yeah. well, if I can't tutor them on that, then I can't tutor them on anything. And uh, it was just a lot of fun. And uh, these were, were just kids full of uh, eagerness to learn. And um, I thought they might be a little shy and standoffish, but they really weren't. And uh, I would like to think, and I think it's hard to measure, but a fair number of students who went through that program went on to college um, or trade schools and these sorts of things. Uh, some of them went back to the settlement and they're working with their own people and others are uh, working off the settlement. That's a beautiful thing, you know. Um, and then another interest of yours was working with historic cemeteries. I remember when I first um, landed there at Iowa State in 91, I think it was, um, one of the things you were working on was uh, historic uh, cemetery work, uh, interpreting tombstones yeah. and things like that. That's where I got into what I call ethnoarchaeology. Um, and I'd always had an interest in cemeteries. In fact, I, I wrote an article that's published in the uh, Journal of the Iowa Archaeological Society called My Life in the Cemetery. Uh, because when I was a kid, my mother and grandmother uh, and grandfather would take me out to the cemetery and they would uh, decorate the graves of our family and, and say prayers uh, and so forth. And, and then they'd start talking about the people represented by those tombstones. And uh, I, I love the stories. And I, 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 I got the idea, I didn't recognize it till years later, that these pieces of stone with inscriptions represented lives lived. And that those lives were still present in the memories of the living. So then I was, many years later, at a uh, meeting of the Society for Historical Archaeology. And uh, a leading uh, archaeologist at the time uh, gave a talk in which he um, uh, talked about a survey he had done that included Jewish cemeteries as well as non-Jewish cemeteries. And then I went up afterwards and uh, said that I enjoyed his lecture, which I did not consider a hostile act. And I asked him, I said, were these Jewish cemeteries reform or orthodox? Were they Eastern or Western Ashkenazi or were they Sephardic? And he didn't deign to answer my question. And so I muttered something naughty and Yiddish under my breath. And I said, you know, I, I'm going to find out for myself. Right. So I went, I went back home to Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, I had never been in the Orthodox Jewish cemetery. Uh, but of course, I'd been in the Reform Cemetery. Uh, that in itself tells you something about the social distance between the Reform German Jews and the Orthodox Eastern European Jews. The fact that I'd grown up there and knew people who were Orthodox, but I'd never been in their cemetery. And as I went out, I found out they'd never been in ours either. So that the thing that that was so exciting for me to learn, and of course I, I love finding out things in my own backyard, was that there's a diversity within groups, an intra-group diversity. And sometimes that distance is almost greater than the, the differences between groups. And it applies to Jews. It applies to, as I found out, uh, working with uh, African-Americans. They're not all alike. And the Hispanics aren't all alike either. And, and Indians need, either. No. So we, you need to look at differences between groups, but you also need to be very mindful of, of uh, differences within groups. And so um, Hannah... Uh, my long-suffering wife and a field assistant for many years, proofreader and so forth. Uh, we started studying 
uh, Jewish cemeteries and have uh, published a book and a number of articles on that. And uh, also um, have some data that I need to work up on the burials of Latvian Americans in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, um, and and other groups. Well, um, I think we have about five more minutes or so of our uh, conversation before our questions are going to be asked. So, why don't I ask you a little bit about um, your your retirement? Uh, some of the places you've gone. A little bit about what you want to say about your family, because none of us is who we are without our family. Well, that's true. And uh, one reason we decided to take an early retirement uh, was to be able to travel. So we've uh, pretty much traveled to all the continents, uh, but Antarctica and probably won't go there. It's a land devoid of great human history. Uh, not that there is an interesting archeology span there, but we've traveled extensively in Latin America, Europe, Africa, Near East, Asia, and the Pacific. Uh, should have done all that traveling before I started teaching because I would have known more. Uh, we also wanted to uh, be able to visit the families of our children who uh, abandoned us in our old age and went to Minnesota, Michigan, and Massachusetts. Um, and we wanted to have time to babysit and get to know our grandkids. We have six grandkids, uh, as they say on uh, Lake Wobegon, all above average. <laughs> anyway, any rate, great grandkids. And uh, I'm still doing research. I also um, wanted to have time to write poetry, one of my avocational interests since I was a child. I've published, uh, I've written a lot of poetry. I've published uh, probably more than three dozen um, pieces. That's my goal in writing isn't to publish, but if a chance comes along, I do that. And uh, some of them are about uh, uh, anthropological interest. So like Lauren Isley, not that I'm the writer, he is, but I hope there's uh, science in my poetry and poetry in my prose. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, you've lived quite a, you think about it in the conversation we've had, you lived quite a diverse life, quite a, in large for um, having some, been someone who was just stuck in Iowa, so to speak, you know, <laughs> I mean, I know that's always the thing that a lot of us, um, because people dream about the Egypt and the, the Holy Land and everything, but, but the fact is everywhere there's humans, there's human history, and it goes very, very deep, and you can always learn something about it. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to do in, uh, uh, that you'd like to say um, before we start taking questions? Well, um, I hope to be able to keep writing to some extent. Um, I've got one uh, essay uh, submitted to the Association for Gravestone Studies, and I'm working on some more poetry and hope to do some more traveling and uh, hope that I uh, can hang around and interact with uh, former students like yourself and uh, others for a few more years down the line. One thing that's I one had, thing I've uh, noticed too is that you have so many students that you've had throughout the years that still remain your friends. That is true. Uh, my one grandfather lived to 96 or 97, depending on whether you believe him or the family prayer book entry. Um, so I wouldn't mind living to 98 just to say I've done it. <laughs> That's cool. What do you think, uh, Elizabeth? Is it time to start looking at questions? Yeah, I'll pop, I'll pop back in here. Uh, Steve DeVore said that you two can both ho hold an audience spellbound. And I have to say, I wholeheartedly agree with that. I've been hanging on your every word. Uh, you you sort of touched on this, but um, Ryan Hull says that, of course, today working with Native Americans and Tippos is a common part of present day projects, but this wasn't always the case. So what milestones and changes in this aspect of the field have you seen over your career? Well, thanks for that question. I think that uh, it all of us have had to work 
uh, with Native Americans as part of changing of the laws with NAGPRA and so forth. Uh, to some degree, um, these discussions were going on uh, earlier, uh, certainly with me, uh, with my association with uh, the Wanatees and Jonathan Buffalo and Maria Pearson, uh, and also through my work with Marvin Kivett, who um, had associations with the Omaha and Winnebago on archeological sites, and also in terms of things as momentous as sacred bundles, which were donated. And, and uh, Gus Kivett, uh, functioning as a holistic anthropologist, uh, made sure that it was appropriate uh, for those sacred objects to be housed and to be presented uh, in an appropriate manner uh, that they would be taken care of. This was also true with uh, my professors, uh, Steve Williams and Joe Brew at Harvard, uh, where they had many Omaha and uh, some Winnebago and Pawnee artifacts. So I think this is all good. They're, they're part of the discussion. Okay. Um, Blake Schnormeyer has asked about the stoneware kilns and then asked, do you know about the Eaton brothers that traveled to Lincoln to start the Lincoln Pottery Works? Um, well, I, um, we of course worked with uh, potteries in Iowa but I'm um, aware of the work that was uh, done there by Peter Bleed, excellent work that he did with the potteries. So what I know about that is from talking to Peter Bleed and uh, reading his reports. And uh, I believe there are students still there working on uh, the materials that he assembled of the Lincoln Pottery Works. And incidentally, uh, with early settlements, along Antelope Creek, an extensive area in the downtown area that, that uh, was cleared for urban renewal. This is maybe a, a question both of you can address, but how do you think academic and CRM archeology span can find agreeable ground for the continuation of, of the field? Lance, do you wanna go first? Well, I. I think that, you know, I remember when I was on the shovel bum trail myself and there was a big division at the time between those who thought themselves as academic archeologists and CRM archeologists. And there was some degree of rivalry and stuff, I would say at that time. Um, I think it all boils down now to in academic archeology, span there's more and more pressure to do things far afield because people relate to things like we said, Egypt or some far exotic place. It, academic archeology span to some extent has kind of withdrawn from um, regional and local kinds of archeology, span which is really sad because that's where some of the more interesting stories to the people who will support you in terms of taxes and funding and stuff. They wanna know about the places they live um, as well as whatever, you know, how the, uh, were built and everything. Um, I think CRM folks at the same time, there's uh, crushes in the budget on, on every front. And um, although people think of it as a frill, um, it's not because if you don't know who you are and where you come from, um, whatever ethnic group you belong to, you have a hard time figuring out what your future is going to be. So I think that um, the, the CRM side they have different problems. Both of them have problems trying to get money. Obviously, we always have problems with that. But I think that um, it would be nice to have more working together like there was at least for a while in the 90s, it seemed like. That's, that's why I think. How about you, David? Well, I think um, I, fortunately, there, I was able to work on both sides of that fence uh, to do CRM archaeology uh, and uh, get money. Uh, to run the field school. And I also did some private uh, CRM um, when I wasn't getting support from the university. But um, I think um, sometimes the academicians, certainly uh, this was a problem with me, that when we put in uh, our, our proposals for 
research, we did not allow enough money for uh, a lab analysis and publication. And we didn't do it because we were doing salvage archaeology in the early days. It was a, uh, you know, we needed to get stuff out of the ground. Um, and that is a problem. Uh, on the other side, sometimes CRM uh, archaeologists and private archaeologists, um, they, they do what is exactly uh, demanded by the project. They don't put it in any kind of uh, oftentimes, not always, but uh, in a broader historical and theoretical framework yeah. uh, because they're hired to do a job and do a job. If I were to go back and do it again, I would not want to work full time in CRM. I was fortunate enough to have the university paying at least my nine month salary. So I did not need to depend uh, on outside resources uh, and I did not need to uh, submit to a pressure to satisfy um, the funders uh, as opposed to what might be my best scientific uh, analysis. Yeah, because I mean, really part of archeology span is really the research questions and the ability to, to start enlarging the knowledge of the field, not just stack up gray literature. True. So thank you, Kirk, for that question. Okay, is there a known Bohoje name for the Des Moines River? Um, I've seen two. Um, first of all, um, the tribes tended to have similar names for the rivers and the rivers were not named after people or things like that. It was named after the resources. So um, the word for the Sheraton River in Missouri is from Charaton, Charaton, which means there are plenty of Shara, which are the water uh, lily, the roots, the Nelumbalutia. And it, you look in Fletcher and Flesh and the name, Omaha name, for the um, Des Moines was the Miketo, and ours would be would be Miketo, which would be Raccoon River too. Um, there's also a possibility that I've come across that there was the name for the Des Moines went from the southeastern part of the state, way up in the headwaters of what was the Buffalo Calfing Ground, and there is uh, the word the Cheton, which would be plenty of the Buffalo River. Um, because that was the route to hunt buffalo, that they would come across all the way up into the areas of um, buffalo country, ri the ridge up there. And um, there's an entry Red Rock. You talk about Red Rock, uh, David, which is on the, the Des Moines. And I came across a legend in one of the local history books that says uh, the people passed down a story about how there was a group of buffalo that would scrape through a narrow place. And the reason the Rocks were red, was from the blood scraped from the buffalo side. So take your pick. Um, plenty of raccoons or plenty of buffalo. <laughs> okay, I am just um, copying and pasting this question from my email. This is from Bill Green, and it's a continuing pleasure and honor to know and work with both of you. And then he has a little message for you in Yiddish, David. Um, Lance, can you say a little bit about your experience at ISU as David's grad student? Well, I can say that it would not have, I wouldn't be where I was, am today without that experience, without David helping me to mentor me through. There are a couple of hard patches. I too, I had some times with some of my classes that, and David it was very encouraging. And so I, I was proud to meet him as my professor and even prouder to know him as my friend. Um, and it oh, was mutual. It was an honor uh, for me to be able to work with someone like you, who's even more eclectic than I. Big hugs, oh scattered brother. <laughs> oh, if only I was a little bit older, I think I would have fit right in with the two of you. Yep, you would have. We've got some hellos from Crystal Alegria, Michael Johnson, who said he enjoyed having classes with you in the early 90s. Um, Luann Hudson also says hello. And there there aren't any more questions. Um, but something that I noticed during your conversation was, so you're, you're talking about really 
engaging with descendant communities and giving back to descendant communities. You're talking about uh, American Indian and indigenous communities and also black communities. Those same conversations are happening again right now very much, uh, including giving more power and voice to archeologists of color. And you also briefly mentioned leaving the SAAs back in the 70s or 80s. And this, it just strikes me as cyclical. There, you know, lots of things have changed. Lots of things have advanced. Uh, but we're still struggling with a lot of the same issues. And I don't know if I have a question regarding that. I just noticed a lot of um, the patterns and what your experience is and what, what a lot of my peers are going through today. And um, my commentary is that, you know, wow, we've been in this profession for decades and, and still some of these issues we struggle with. I don't know what it's going to take to, to, you know, keep moving forward. We are moving forward, but faster, right? Some of us want things to happen faster. Um, so I don't know if you have any words of wisdom or patience for us in the younger generations, David. There, we don't exist in a vacuum. Um, uh, there's the larger society around us. And I think you're right that some of these things are cyclical. Um, I know I used to sometimes get a little impatient and think, as I would lecture in class, I already said that. Well, maybe I said it four years ago and there are new students there or whatever. So I think we need to, uh, we need to keep with, uh, keep up uh, what we are doing. My grandfather who was raised speaking German as well as um, English used to use the expression stick mit der keg, which was actually kind of a combination of uh, German and, and uh, English. Uh, but uh, it's like, uh, s have a fixity of purpose, stay with, your, stay with your project. And I think that's what we need to do. Um, and we need to work as citizens of a larger society, which uh, if you have a chance for early voting now, go vote and certainly vote in November because there are some really big issues uh, that we're facing in American society as to uh, the matter of tolerance and immigrants. I mean, uh, we're, we, unless we're Native Americans, uh, like Lance is, or at least part of him, uh, then, then we're all uh, immigrants to the United States. I mean, some of some of Lance's ancestors were uh, were available to greet the Mayflower, uh, maybe to greet the Vikings too. I don't know, but we're, uh, all, we're all braided rivers, right? It's not like we're one river. It's like we that's have cattle right, to come absolutely. In. But we need to be mindful participants in our society. And there's also, I think it will take up a lot of the screen, but there's another hello from Marsha Miller. She says, I spent from 1973 to 1983 getting my degree in anthro under David and other great professors at ISU. It was a wonderful time. I've often thought that in the scramble to create classes and diversity, it would be simpler to just make anthropology a required class. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Marsha. <laughs> I agree. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Iowa Archaeological Society who provided some funding for uh, us education staff at OSA to do digital programs such as this and get some of the software and equipment we needed. It, um, it's not easy to learn this. And David, you're such a trooper for uh, participating and, you know, just, you just kind of put in your all to help me make this happen. And I appreciate that so, so much. And Lance, it's always a pleasure working with you and communicating and collaborating with you. So I want to thank you both just for helping make this series happen. And this was such an engaging interview. I know that lots of people are gonna be watching these videos now on Facebook and YouTube. So on behalf of everybody watching, um, just thank, thank you so, so much. No, thank thank you. you. And uh, people can contact us by email. Maybe you can include the emails in the information. Yep, I will type um, your emails in the comments. I'm going to write a note to do that right now. And I am then going to sign off of the live program.
Bye. Thank you.